Good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Mark Britton, and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Syngenta Potato Portfolio. But during the course of this week, Syngenta has been running a series of virtual potato science live events. Um, today's topic is sustainability, and the Syngenta presenters for today are Belinda Bailey and Max Newbert. Uh, I thought it was useful just to give you a reminder of the sessions that we've run during the rest of the week. So on Monday, we had a session on seed and soil-borne pathogens. Tuesday, we covered soil pest management. On Wednesday, it was blight management. Yesterday, we looked at uh, biostimulants. And all of those recordings are available on the Syngenta UK TV YouTube channel if you weren't able to join us. Before I hand over to uh, Belinda and Max, it's got a housekeeping slide I'd just like to cover. So Syngenta is the host who record this webinar via Zoom. And the recording will be published on the Syngenta UK TV channel uh, on YouTube, and that'll be after the event. Uh, no recording by anyone else or by any other means is permitted. If you have any questions, and we'll be taking questions and answering them at the, the end of the session, but please submit them via the Q&A function, uh, not via chat. And tomorrow we'll send you an email with information on how to apply for basis and Enroso points. And that will also include a link to a feedback survey. So it'd be great if you could uh, obviously, like to apply for your basis and the ROSO points, but also give us some feedback on the, the session for today and for the previous sessions if you've been able to join us for those. So, with that, I'll hand over to Belinda and Max. Well, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the sustainable session this morning. So, my name uh, is, is Belinda Bailey, and I'm the sustainable farming manager for the UK and Ireland. And Max is the uh, technical uh, sustainability manager who is going to help with our presentation this morning. So, um, globally, Syngenta are investing two billion um, by 2025 uh, on sustainability projects supporting farmers to improve sustainability globally. So, as part of that, in the UK, we have a, a number of projects, and this morning I'm going to talk to you about our Green Headland project. So if we move on to the next slide, you can just see here a, a picture of what I'm talking about. So this project is specifically for the potato crop, but as we have moved over the years, it has now expanded into more vegetable crops. And also last year, it was seen to work nicely in cereal crop, crops where we had the very, very wet spring and many growers took the opportunity to plant unplanted headlands uh, with, with this mixture. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about the project. So back in 2015 at the cereals event, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Brown, who's the director um, for sustainability at ASDA, approached me and wanted to get involved in the Operation Pollinator project that we got. He was looking at some of the wildflower um, mixtures that we had and wanted to see what he could do to get involved. <laughs> So from, from that time on, we um, discussed what, what we might like to do and what we'd like to achieve. And this is how the, the project was started. So we looked at um, potatoes specifically, particularly where growers were leaving headlands unplanted. And we started with six growers who uh, started the project with us in 2016 and are still very much involved in the project. And they, they uh, help us uh, look at some of the aspects of what we're doing, um, particularly on, on their interests and what they would like to understand from, from what we are gaining from planting biodiversity habitats uh, on, on these, these bare headlands. So what we've done, we, we worked in the potato crop and with a, an entomologist, Paul Lee, he's been sweeping the, the margins for us to look at what biodiversity that we're finding above the ground uh, in, in the in the crops and also we've done some um, pitfall traps to look at insects uh, at ground level as, as well. So Paul has gone out and done that uh, for the last four years for us and we have um, done the pitfall traps for a year and I say Max will, will look, uh, give us an insight of some of the results that we've had from that. Also what we're doing within this project is looking at the soil health benefits as well. So planting the headlands rather than leaving them bare, we're, we're helping reduce uh, soil erosion, uh, catching runoff, uh, it, it supports margins around water courses, it helps with the soil structure with the with the mixture that we've got, we're capturing um, nutrients and then uh, able to put those nutrients back into the ground. Um, so. Um, 
things like nitrogen, etc. And then with the biomass, we can help support um, organic matter as, as well. So that's what we've been doing since since 2016, and we've had some really, really encouraging results, and uh, the project has uh, has expanded uh, through the years. So if we just look at the next slide, you can see that um, we originally started, um, as I say, in 2016, and through that time we sold uh, 605 hectares worth of seed. Um, last year we saw a big increase, and just in that one year we, we had 330 hectares and if we think about that uh, as a margin if we think of a six meter margin that covers 550 kilometers worth of, of headland so a huge amount of uh, extra resource and biodiversity habitat for for pollinators for other insects for beneficials um, as, as well so the original mix that we started with was a, a brassica base mix so we as you see there we had bursine clover buckwheat all radish Cecilia and vetch. But what we um, found from the growers that were involved, they wanted to also have a look at a mixture that didn't have that brassica element, so it fitted better with some of their other crops that they had in their, their rotation on the farm. So we then uh, put together with Kings um, a bursine clover, buckwheat, Cecilia, vetch, linseed and crimson clover. All the seed mixtures have, have come, come through Kings and uh, they have uh, supported this project as one of our partners, along with ASDA, who are our, our other partner, who have invested a, a lot of um, time and um, money into this project to help us um, get to where we've got to, to today. So if we just have a look at the agronomic aspects of the seed mixtures, the idea is we wanted to have a mixture that was um, simple to manage, uh, straightforward to, um, to plant, and that was reliable as well. So the, with a seed rate of 20 kilos, the packs come in a 20, 20 kilo pack, and you are able to drill it just below the surface or broadcast it and roll afterwards. The seed bed doesn't need to be um, that um, that um, sort of um, friable. It, it, we need to be able to get a good seed uh, soil contact on the surface, but we don't need to cultivate to, to depth. Planting time, we suggest late April when the soils are warming up, so we get a good quick uh, establishment and you can plant right through to sort of mid-August when the, um, the soils are still warm. The cult as I say, the cultivation doesn't need to be at depth. To encourage a good growth um, early on, we, we suggest a, uh, an application of up to 30 kilos of nitrogen, but we do know that many growers uh, don't do this and they, they do get a good establishment. Depending on what you're really looking for from, from the, the seed mixture, if you're wanting to get make the most from the biomass and nutrient capture, you, you can uh, top during mid flowering to um, extend uh, and create more um, biomass and encourage encourage more rooting. What you will need to do if you're, you're concerned on seed return is to destroy um, with topping mid flowering or spray with, with glyphosate in preparation for the following crop. But I do know that many growers that have been involved in this project have left some of their margins and they have been used very much for, for overwintering uh, birds. Uh, so um, it, it's really up to you to, to how and when you need to, to uh, remove these, these margins. So with that, um, we are continuing the project, Syngenta Fund, part of the seed mixture, and we have an offer through Kings. So um, what we've got here is the cost of the seed is subsidised by Syngenta and it's £35 a hectare pack and as I say the, the pack comes in a 20 kilo uh, size. So if you're interested in wanting to, to try some of the, the headland mix you can either go to our Syngenta website and look under the sustainability pages for the seed mixture information or you can go to Kings directly and contact them and they, they uh, are very happy to help and will organise uh, for delivery for you. So that's a little bit about the, the project and the seed mixture and how you can uh, um, buy some seed if you would like but now what I'm going to do is pass over to Max who's going to run us through some of the results that we have seen. Okay thank you Max. Thank you very much, Belinda, and uh, good morning, everybody. As Belinda said, what I'm going to do is sort of take you through 
what we've been doing for well the last four or five years now looking at the green headland mix um, as Brent said at the start this initial project was really to look at it as a soil retention soil improvement mix um, to go around bare headlands or as you can see in that picture as well there's potential for things like maize to keep the soil into the field rather than let it escape um, but since then it has developed into more of a biodiversity piece as well but just some visuals on what we've been finding now these photos here these are in, in Suffolk um, in the Breckland area incredibly flat um, but we've got very very light band and so this is a headland um, photo one direction surrounding a carrot field in this instance um, on one direction without the headland and then the opposite direction there's a carrot field with the headland mix and what we find is we're improving the soil retention we're increasing the penetration of water as well so it percolates down reducing the runoff on top of having that um, rooting mix in there so the selection of plants originally were very much to have uh, a good diversity of rooting types that would be you know especially with the brassica mix uh, all radish with a deep penetrating root to go through the soil profile and then a lot of the other elements having a mixed range of depths but really to hold down the soil as best as possible so that we have that soil retention and then what we hoped was once these uh, elements had been through the season what the headland would be returned to the field would actually be in a better state than it had been at the end and that is the report we're getting from a, a lot of growers that they've got an improved stru soil structure in these areas which makes it easier to then establish the pollen crop on that headland if they choose to do this now just to be clear this is an annual mix um, which means that's why it works well for following a sort of root crop rotation that will only be once a year or, uh, or shorter so that's why we have it like that um, but even in that time, we do see benefits to the soil structure and reduction in runoff, especially with thinking about fields that might have irrigation on as well. And talking about that, you know, one of the main um, questions or queries is obviously that these are working fields. You need to get in and out of them, have equipment, uh, irrigation equipment. Yes, exactly where the wheelings will go, there will be loss of the headland mix. Um, but as you can see from this picture, this probably taking what when did I take this picture? end of July um, timing, early August, and obviously it's been traveled on all year, but you can see it's only loss of cropping is exactly where we've been driving through. Obviously with your irrigation equipment, where the large plants sit, there'll be a bit of loss of crop there, but overall we find it's very resilient. And if uh, careful spraying of herbicides is done, it will be there all year and do a very good job of its soil benefits as well as what we'll talk about later, its biodiversity benefits. So it's very resilient. And because we're having a mix, each of the mixes doesn't matter which one, there's a diversity of plants there. We always get good establishment of parts of the mix, if not all of the mix. So it's, uh, it's very resilient. Then we wanted to start looking, okay, what are we getting from this mix? What is the you know, benefit to having it on farm? So um, we did one meter cut down. So this is where we take exactly a meter square of the top surface foliage from the mix and see how much biobass is there and what is in its sort of um, nutrient makeup. So you can see this initial work we've been doing is three locations. Um, we've got a bit of information about that location's soil, uh, indicated in the bold, and then underneath that, this is all the information we got from that one meter cut down. So at the, at the high end, we were getting about 36 tonnes a hectare of green mass, um, with the lowest being around 24, nearly 25 uh, tonnes a hectare. And you can see what the dry matter was in there. So we're between sort of 11 and 19 percent dry matter. So we're creating a lot of organic material, which obviously once it's destroyed and reincorporated, we've got hand volume and potentially, especially in the areas we've been looking at with very light soil, hopefully aiding in the future um, soil moisture retention as well, if this is done as a long term rotational project on farm. Uh, also, just to say, we did do a NP and key analysis. Now, what we found was we, in this study, was that we could get to over 200 pounds worth of um, nutrient capture, um, obviously by the growing crop to you know, reduce leaching of certain elements, but also there will be a bit of production there because we have got the leguminous parts of the things like the vetch and the clovers. So we are adding quite a lot of value. Obviously it will be to the headland, but with, on top of the soil retention improvement to the structure, and, and that is the feedback we get, we have a more friable soil, 
and better establishment at the end. I think this does show that it has a, a very relatively immediate benefit to the grower as well. We wanted to take this on um, and get some more detailed understanding of, you know, not just saying it improves soil, but getting some metrics around that. So we have done some work this year with the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, this was uh, an interesting one because we were doing this work but around arable crops in 2020. And this was primarily, that was a, an option also viewed by ourselves after the awful autumn we had in 2019, where there was quite a few fields where we managed to get the field planted, but not the headland. So we had a lot of bare headlands, even around arable crops going into 2020. So we use this mix um, around those arable fields to then hold the soil and do the same job basically that we'll in root crops. And then we had GWCT uh, study it through the season and we haven't got the full report back, but this is some of the comments around their initial findings they have had. And it's a lot of writing on the screen, but really it boils down to um, what they, they brought back in production. Like we've said with other growers that we've had in the project over the last few years, they were seeing that we had much better um, soil structure, which made it easier to establish the crop from 2020 into 2021. So hopefully what we're going to have is some metrics about how much of an improvement that was um, following, which would be really interesting. But a few other notable parts is obviously uh, there was a reduction in soil moisture. So compared to bare soil, uncultivated soil, if you left it, so 30%. So that has to be, uh, be taken to mind. In some instances, that would be good. Some instances that might have to be managed but that is a potential benefit of it, making this all lighter and not as waterlogged. And then they had very similar results to us where they never got anything lower in biomass production than 20 tonnes a hectare, and they had the highest reaching about 40 tonnes a hectare. Now, generally the, the higher end does seem to be with the brassica mix, um, but we do need to do some more work on the non brassica mix. The other notable elements was around this was the soil mineral nitrogen uh, capture was about 50% compared to the bare soil. Now, that would be really good as we were talking about you know retention of the nutrients in the field is really of interest for this especially around the headlands now what we're also hoping is to get some idea of percolation or uh, soil organic matter change nutrient change and compaction levels but um, obviously it was a short study and we had the time of the study was an incredibly dry year so fortunately in this instance we didn't actually see any discernible differences in those areas but we'll continue doing work to see if there's a long-term improvement so that was the soil piece. Um, when the DWCT data comes through, obviously, hopefully we'll have a lot more on that. But it, it, everything we've done so far has led us to see a real soil benefit that has then had a good impact on the following crops, as well as obviously the benefits, as Belinda said, uh, protecting watercourses, acting as a buffer, etc. But the part that's really sort of over the last few years been probably turned into the main focus has been the biodiversity element with Paul Lee studying the crops. So he's been going through those project farms for the last six years and carrying out sweep net traps. And this is just a summary of three years work, 2016 to 2018. And this, these two charts uh, on the left is the specimens split into what uh, species they are, but the uh, portion of uh, individuals. So how many of those fall into these different categories? So in large, like many other studies, a lot of insect life on farm and in field is beetles followed by bugs but what we've been wanting to do and we've got some data later to show that we are enriching this is that we're trying to also propagate potentially beneficials such as hoverflies, lace wings especially spiders um, but as we're doing, bringing a pollen rich and nectar rich mix on farm the idea was also this area around butterflies moths bees wasps ants anything that is attracted to a food source that isn't usually there now, just to say, this is a very opportunistic mix. We're not trying to replace habitat. We're trying to put habitat on bare soil that would not necessarily have a benefit to insect life. As such, it's, it's a good system to enrich your local fauna and flora. Uh, and I'll come on to it later about what that means of your landscape and what is the biggest factor for, for biodiversity on farm. Uh, and then you can just see how the species makeup is as well. So species, we get a bit more biodiversity than the individual numbers might lead you to believe. And you can see we do get, although in the sweet messing, the uh, individuals are low, we do have a bit more biodiversity species-wise when we're looking at those um, things we are trying to really enrich. 
But just to break that down, I've just put this in to give an idea of um, how much work has been done in this uh, over the last few years. And also to make you feel sorry for Paul Lee, because he's got to look down the microscope and identify uh, the amount of individuals. But over this three year period, we had um, 89,000 individuals captured over the sampling. And what Paul Lee does, he goes uh, twice to each site through July um, and August and sweep nets uh, a cross section of each margin and then takes those back and identifies the individual. In 2017, you can see we had a quite large bump to um, species diversity. And that was because that was the year we tried to have a look at pitfall traps as well. And that, you know, just we did that one year just to see if we could uh, see any difference. Um, and it did, as always, with pitfall traps, it did boost the number of types of uh, ground dwelling, generally beetle species we're finding. Um, but he also, you know, he's broken it down to, you know, we've got nearly 100 species that have some role in pollination in this study. And we've got about 143 species that are known to have some form of predator or parasitite type action that could what led us to believe maybe we could use this as a propagation factor for that IPM effect of having beneficials in the farm as well doing the predation but you can just see each year broken down to the number of species in each category and the changes over that time generally it's relatively static you can see there is that boost into 2017 where we had the pitfall trap and then in 2018 we went back to just sweep netting but we did a bit more work we did the same in 2019, um, and it was very much a similar split that we've always done. But you, in this, I'm just showing this so you can see, you know, in a single year, we're doing around 20,000 um, individuals have been caught. Roughly around 200, 300 species a year are identified, and you can just see the different colours, what has been split out of the species or the specimens, I should say. But again, beetles, flies and bugs are the majority, but what we're trying to enrich is the smaller section here, which has got the bees and the butterflies in. So in 2020, we did a slightly different um, study where we were trying to compare more what is the change in biodiversity of this headland mix compared to what you might have as a potentially long-term uh, grass margin on farm. What's the difference there? Um, as I said, I'm not, we're not trying to replace that. We're just interested, what is the benefit up and above just the static uh, habitat for these insects? So you can see a slightly different, smaller study, just under 10,000 specimens. But again, the number of species not different from previous years, around 200 or not pitfall traps. So not a huge difference, as you can see in the split again, it's bugs, beetles and flies as the majority again. Um, but it's quite interesting when we start comparing, splitting those out into the different habitats. So this is done in this chart. So this is across the those six uh, sites that we have had in the project for a long time. And you can see what I've done here is split what we found in the green heather margin with the grass margin total number of species in the blue bars and specimens, so number of individuals, so total insect number in uh, the red dots. So as you might expect with a long-term habitat that's had plenty of time to propagate a, uh, an ecosystem, there is a higher species diversity, which again, as we'll see in the following slides, is more skewed towards the sort of land-dwelling beetle and bug type species. But what is interesting is because we're creating a high volume food source for um, insect life, we are nearly doubling the number of individual specimens we're finding per uh, uh, sampling time. So it is enriching, it is acting as a short-term shelter and food sources, which is exactly what we wanted this to do, to enrich whatever is in your local area. And you can just see this here broken down. So left of the dotted line is sort of individual type species, and on the right of the dotted line is how we break them down into their, their sort of mode of action of insect life. And in blue, again, is the green headland, red is the grass margins. And you can see we are attracting sort of the more pollinator type wanting uh, species in our um, uh, headland mix. And then when we go to the grass margin, it leans again back heavily to the ground dwelling beetle type. So you don't want more than one than the other. It's always about having a mix of diversity of um, ecosystems on farm. So you can see this is offering something different. And then when you look at the type of insect we're attributing, so herbivores, you could start to skew at the pest type. So, you know, minor plant bugs and, and the like there, you can see they're skewed towards the grass margins. But when we're coming to pollinators and predator species, that does very well in the headland mix numerically. And then when you compare the ratio is very important of pest to predator, as you can see with the green headland mix, 
roughly each year we get about three times the number of pets in predators, which initially sounds um, bad, because obviously a higher number for the pets. But during this study, uh, we've been very interested to make sure that we weren't propagating any major pests. And as today, we're not propagating um, serious aphid problems. The pests we are finding generally might have plant bugs, uh, sometimes a bit of cabbage and flea beetles being found, things like that, nothing uh, too elaborate. But the, the predator species are high because you have to remember the predators we're finding, some of them can consume 120 pests in their lifetime. So it's acting really quite strong in the predator side. And that's because we do have non-specific insects you know, supporting that. Because you can't have predators if you don't have a pest or insect life there to support it. So there is this balance and we seem to be hitting it quite well. I'm not saying there isn't ever any aphids, but they've never come up strongly or in any number in the sweet netting. And the only time I've ever seen aphids really in this mix has been with the brassica mix right at the end of the season when we're going into the autumn period, if it has not been already destroyed and we get a bit of rabbit karani build up on the ball radish. But this, all this data seems to show it is a very good system for potentially propagating uh, a predator uh, population for mediation of certain diseases, obviously, specifically aphids are very uh, wanted to be controlled because of the lack of chemistry or reducing chemistry around particularly Midas. And uh, hot the flies example here are potentially one of the best type predators for that pest. But just to sort of, before moving on, to touch on, okay, what are we doing here? So you can see this is, a, this is from our 2016 to 2018 data, but it's just a split of what we've done with look at these margins, the number of margins we've looked at around different crops. So as Belinda said, this was primarily a potato mix, and you can see we have highly focused around potatoes with 44 uh, sampled headlands around potatoes. But if you look across, what it is, is these two, this is the individuals per margin and the species per margin split into their mean number, their min and max number. Now, generally they're the same. Yes, it's a bit skewed maybe towards potatoes, but generally the, it's very even levels of representation. It doesn't matter what the crop is. When you look down into the data, the areas that have more biodiversity, it's, it's the farm itself. And it always gets every year the same sort of several farms come out as the top as biodiverse because they've got a different land use around them, which they're pulling on because we're, what we're doing, we're not creating uh, you know, out of nothing a ecosystem. What we're doing, we're enriching what's already there. So your biodiversity is going to be based on your local land use and what's already there. What you can do with these types of mixes is enrich it and support it in the long term, potentially improving it, but in the short term, you're supporting it. And just to note also through this entire study, Paul Lee has been noting all the rare and notable species and putting them back into the census. But this is just a snapshot of some of the species we've been finding that have been notable. Um, you can see their common name on the left, their scientific name uh, in the second column. Here is what it's listed as, as its official status, you know, endangered, vulnerable, rare. And then the final was the year it got that designation. So you know, just to pull out a few of these, um, interesting one is bee wolf. Um, in some respects, you might not want the bee wolf. It's a, it's a predator wasp species that feeds on bees, as the name might suggest. But what it does say is that we're supporting such a strong and um, large bee population that we can then have these rare notable spe predator species that have been facing difficulty. So things like that really does go to show this is enriching and, and creating a very dense source of biodiversity and, and food for all these different species over and above what you might initially think it's not just the nectar and pollen we're producing but then it's obviously the food network we're producing up from that stage so this is really encouraging so following on from you know we've, we've looked at that beneficial potential viewpoint there's also the fact for you know it's particularly potatoes with pby pva these are non-persistent viruses that stay on the style of the aphids which means they can be lost if you perturb the length of time the aphid acquires it and then feeds on a susceptible crop. We know that most aphids will be migrating in from the headland. So having a five, six meter headland, does that give us enough time to reduce the amount of virus the aphid carries if it makes it through that headland and then eventually to the crop? The second part, as you can see on the screen is, 
beneficial insects, are they then on having a compound effect? You know, we're making the aphids less virulent, but are less aphids getting to the field or propagating the field because we've got more predation? So in this study, this was back in 2018, we all started to have a look where we took a hectare out of a field that had no green headland, uh, in carrots this was, um, and we had a headland opposite where we had the green headland around that field. We noticed where we found uh, beneficial insects and there from a single uh, sample time, you can see where we found them in the field compared to the field with the headland. So there was more integration of beneficial insects. And two, did we see any difference in, in yellowing or viral symptoms? Now, the image on the screen just gives you a sort of visual demonstration of what we're trapping in field in the headland comparatively to a field that doesn't have the headland. So you can see the biomass increase, but just having the green headland it is, it, it is large and very visual. Into the field, this is about five meters into the field, what we're finding. So there is definitely a boost over having it than not having it, but you can see it does already just five meters in dwindle quite largely. And that's not a surprise, you know, the food source for all those insects isn't in the field itself, it's in the headland, but we're definitely having a potential benefit of having the headland next to a field, allowing some penetration of those beneficial insects. In this instance, we did actually find a 70% reduction in yellowing symptoms with the headland mix, um, but the caveat with this year, it was a relatively low virus year. So to make significant conclusions from that, I can't say, but as I talk, all the work we have suggests it, we're never having more of an issue. And that has been the worry of many that we have um, created a, a potential pest problem next to the field, but that is not currently the, the case. And also because we don't have umbilifers, we've never found carrot fly. So for the specific pest we've been promoting this around, it hasn't been propagating those. In 2019, we're sort of taking this a step further. Okay, if we are using this as a beneficial uh, production factory in, in many respects, how far or how effective is that into the crop? Does it dwindle immediately? Does it go all the way into the crop? And if, if it does dwindle quite fast, you know, do, how often might we have to do this as an infield uh, you know, approach, as well as uh, just around the headland on the margins? So I've broken this down, um, you can see uh, individuals, how they break it down. And in this instance, I've broken down this study into are they a pest species, are they a predator species, are they a pollinator species, or are they just a general insect that doesn't have a specific role that has an impact on the grower. So you've got uh, the individuals and the species and how the split is. So in this instance, um, you can see with individual numbers, actually this was closer than usual where we we're getting nearly a one-to-one, -one, but it was you know, over a one-to-one -to, -one to the pest side. And uh, in the species diversities, you can see how that split. And this was done, this trapping was done at the headland, 25 meters in the headland, 50 meters, 75 meters, 100 meters, to get an idea of what is the effect into uh, the crop. And you can see the numbers break down here where it does, it does reduce quite dramatically. But I think the next slide is easier to show that where what we have is basically a 90% drop off of all types of species where especially with the pollinator species, you can see there just isn't any pollinator species. As soon as you're at that headland, they are not foraging for food in a non-flowering crop. Hence, we just have no species being trapped. But you can see the pests and predators does go down quite dramatically, but they do sort of bubble along all the way into the field. But to get to these sorts of numbers of pests and predators, well, particularly predators, um, we want to have that ingress. Now, this suggests we'll probably have to have them really regular through the field, you know, you know, on your tram lines, 36 meters at most potentially, and have that effect hopefully give uh, a reduction in pests overall, because we will need a constant population, because if, if we're, you know, having an IPM approach where you've got standard farm practice reducing populations anyway, if you want them to come in when there's a little food source, they will have to be close by to be foraging there. So we do need this uh, effect quite regular in the field to achieve that. But just a visual of that, so this is the trap, so you can see the biomass we were having in the green headland itself, very, very large. And that drop off is more or less instant where you can see, yes, there's a few insects uh, in the other traps at the different uh, depths into the field. Um, but what actually most you can see in these traps was um, grounds or seeds, so not actually insects themselves. So it just shows if we do want this as a in-field penetrative effect, we do need it to be regular. Um, but I would suggest that is that is the uh, a, a very strong, um, practice, you know, headland should do the majority of the work, but if we, we you know, we're going to do more work on this in the following years, just to check what's the difference between just headland versus uh, in-field effects as well on controlling pests 
primarily around virus is what we're, we're concerned about. So we did try and do this again. This is carrots, but it's the same idea. We, this was our first look at an in-field trial. Uh, and this was at the BCGA Open Day in 2019. And you can see we did a couple of beds of the headland mix in the field itself to see the in-field effect. And uh, you can see the layout there. We did this next to a insecticide trial control and we had the non-insecticide purely beneficial uh, headland mix. We did in introduce a few natural predators to enrich it because obviously it wasn't linked to a headland. This was in the middle of the field. So there was uh, parasitic wasps, lacewings, ladybirds introduced. And we were trying to see what was the difference in virus control uh, in this trial with these two different approaches. Now, this is the result. So very low virus overall, not a huge amount to say, unfortunately. Um, but what it does show, we didn't cause more of an issue that there was. When we do this again, I would not do it in the center of the carrot field because obviously we're surrounded by um, a standard farm practice. So the pressure was inevitably going to be low. But I think with the data here, again, it shows we're not causing more of an issue than anything. You know, we were very similar to the other treatments, not any difference between them. The only visual difference in this trial was the fact that because we were missing the insecticide phrase, we missed some of the micronutrients going on. So there was a slight coloration difference there, but that's purely nutrition based. So the potential's there and we're not causing more issues to the crop um, than we'd want. So as I said, we wanted to progress this rather than just have it in the center of the field. Can it work in the farm practice in field? Um, so last year, Eric Anderson uh, reached out to us and asked about trying out some of the mixes. So we provided both the brassica mix you can see on the left there and the non brassica mix on the right. And he tried this in field in seed potatoes up in Scotland or on the spot farms. Uh, and you can see both of them established incredibly well. Um, and uh, thanks to Eric and also Kate T. Murray, uh, field force member up there, took the photos. And they established really well, didn't have any issues with in-field agronomy. These were standard farm practice, these fields, and it worked really, really well. Unfortunately, again, not a lot of uh, virus differences because the pressure wasn't there to see anything. Um, but what Eric did have done was he did have a study of a uh, number of invertebrates sampled in each of those mixes. So again, you can see here, this time we've got the green headland brassica mix on the left and it's control versus the non brassica. And what is really nice to see is that the green headland itself, um, again, much more than the control, but the brassica mix doing very, very well. Cause I've got to admit, we've done less work on the non brassica mix, but if anything, this is suggesting there was even slightly more numerically, not uh, significantly, but numerically more uh, insect life attracted to the non brassica mix. So it really does have the potential there. Eric didn't have any issues with the agronomy having it in the field. So I think, you know, going forward, we're going to do more work on this and see what the benefit could be to the end user. So that's everything I really wanted to say around the headland mix. I think, you know, as time go on, we, we've shown it's always a benefit on farm to, to have fair soil. We know that we're retaining the soil, producing a, a better soil by the end of the season as well. And producing biomass, especially if you're, if you're on light land in potatoes and carrots and onions, Having more organic masses improve the water retention long term by having this as a rotational effect is fantastic. And it, and it is a rotational effect. You know, this is an opportunistic annual mix. We don't expect this to be in the more, one, more than one year. So I think this is really beneficial. So on top of, you know, the nutrient capture being large. Yes, some of those are less mobile, but, you know, especially for the, the nitrogen production and capture, I think that could be really beneficial on the headlands. And then the benefits we've been seeing around biodiversity, you know, it can't be argued with we're having a huge boon to biodiversity, especially the species we are concerned about, the pollen and nectar potentially deprived um, species that we can help produce a food source, which then, as we've already seen with just some of the predators we've been finding in the mix, does then support a larger food network uh, in the ecosystem you have. But just to say, you can't improve from nothing. So if there's a poor ecosystem, this can help maintain what you do have, but to enhance it greatly, significantly, you know, in our previous work, three to 5% of the farm needs to be on some form of these floristic margins so that you have a significant benefit to insects as well as uh, knock on to bird and small mammal life. Um, so further on, we want to do more work on the, the sort of incorporation with IPM. And so that's going to be our sort of goals for 2021 and 2022 20, uh, onwards. Um, and I think this is a, you know, for the cost of this, this is fantastic. And I would just like to thank, obviously, Belinda Bailey for all the help and work she does around this, but also Kings and Asda who've supported this project uh, since the start. And with that, I'll hand back to Mark. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. That's uh, Belinda and, and Max. So we have had one question come in. So I guess before I answer that, just a reminder to just everybody who's watching, if you do have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A function. So at the moment, we just have one question. So once we've answered that, we will be uh, finishing the session. So please send in your questions now. So to uh, Belinda and Max. So um, the first question is, with um, farm prices being low for, for many, do you think that businesses can afford to sort of undertake and adopt sustainable agriculture? Okay, good question. I, I think times are changing and we know that uh, policy direction is changing as we move towards um, ELMS rather than the, the direct payments. And, and that will encourage growers um, to take the opportunities to hopefully do things like this green covers environmental benefits that all fit within sort of sustainable agriculture so I think um, yes I, I, perhaps prices will, will need to increase and uh, Brexit might have a, a, an impact on, on, on that as well but um, I, I know supermarkets um, may be reluctant to pay more but but that might might come so um, farmers are going to have to do things more in a sustainable way but that support to make the make it financially stack up has, has to be there and, and that is the, the, the thoughts uh, on how elms uh, will support that I don't know if Max has got anything to add on yeah it, it's a good question I mean it... I think that it's more, especially for this type of mix, it's more of an issue when thinking about um, rented land and things like that, because it's investment potentially in the land that you don't have an impact on. So I think there's that that's the major difficulty with this, and especially for Operation Pollinator, the idea is we're trying to subsidize it to reduce that cost of entry. So especially if you, you know, you, you don't change it to a system all in one go, there needs to be progress on that. Um, so things like this allows um, people to try it, find out how it works and make it cost effective. because. With this, we are showing there is going to be a long-term financial benefit to farm. Obviously, you don't need, want it to be too costly for cost of entry, um, but schemes like this do help that journey, I think. But uh, yes, it is a concern, but I don't think it is a complete barrier. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there's a question around sort of the location of some of the farms that you've been using in your work. Do you have to answer that? Yes, the majority of the, the farms uh, that we've been looking at this project have been in more of east, uh, so Cambridge, and then moving across um, to, to Elvedon, uh, so the, the Norfolk, Suffolk area, um, purely because of the where Paul Lee, our entomologist, uh, lives, uh, so it's got to be within distance for him. Um, but we have also looked at um, farms up in, in the Yorkshire area as well. So although we haven't gone up into Scotland or everywhere, anywhere, um, we, we have tried to get a bit of a, a geographical spread. Thank you. And do you have a view on so how wide the, sh the strip should be across the field, two metres or four metres? So from our work, ideally you want around five to six metres, so six metres for drilling effectively. So four minimums, metres would be minimum, um, but having six metres makes it enough depth that, that when we look at the data and where it's been thinner than that, there has been a negative effect on the amount of samples in those. So having six metres really is um, ideal, I would say, for these. Thank you, Max. And do we know if the use of these mixes is going to be covered in elms? We hope so. At this stage, uh, Elms uh, is, isn't clear on that. Um, we've certainly um, in, encouraging uh, sort of input into Elms and uh, showing what we're what the work is that we're doing. But at the moment, the the definitions of deep and detail on on the Elms are, are not clear at this stage. That's great. Thank you for that. Well, that was the um, final question that we had uh, submitted via the Q and A function. So I'd like to say the opportunity to thank you, Max and Belinda, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for everybody else for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time, uh, one, to attend the events, but also to ask the questions. Um, just a reminder that the previous sessions that we've covered this week will be available on the Syngenta UK TV YouTube channel. So please feel free to go back and look at any sessions that you may have been able to, unable to attend. Uh, information on how to apply for the basis and Enroso points will be sent in the follow-up email. And as I said earlier on, we'd really love to hear your feedback. So please, when you get the survey, if you can, we'd appreciate it if you take the time to uh, 
uh, complete that survey and send it back to us. I think finally, just remind so, so an opportunity for me to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, and also, you know, I wish you a happy and successful season for 2021. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody.